Hi, I'm Michelle Fenton, and welcome to the Happy Texture Podcast. What would it take to develop resilient, sustainable communities? How do we design cities that support our collective happiness? Join me as my guests and I discuss how we can plan, implement, and foster places that allow us to flourish and grow. So today on the Happy Texture podcast, I am so delighted to have Brad McConnell from the Rick Henson Foundation here with us. Brad, thank you for being here. And the generosity of your time is really, I'm really grateful for. Brad's experience, both lived and knowledge, really, I think, codifies what accessibility and inclusivity means in BC, probably in Canada and maybe even internationally. In 1990, he formed the Barrier Free Design Inc., tried to fill the gap between the application of the building code and real needs of people in the community with disabilities. He also specializing in access and inclusion, worked on terminals, public buildings and events, more notably the 2010 Olympics and Paralympic Games, and is a member of the International Paralympic Committee's Accessibility Working Group. In 2015, if I'm not mistaken, Brad, you joined the Rick Hansen Foundation as the Vice President of Access and Inclusion. And through that position, you worked in developing an industry standard for certification that would create incentives for developers, planners, facility operators, and I would say even architects and designers to build a more inclusive environment. I mean, I could go on. This is basically a third of your resume. When I looked at your resume, it was a full letter size page. And, you yeah. know, I that encourage anyone. It's <laughs> <laughs> your second career. I mean, it's it's more than one lifetime's worth of work here. And I encourage anyone listening to actually go look up Brad and look at all the amazing things he's done. He's probably influenced your life in some significant way. And it would be wonderful to to have a look at that. But, you know, your CV is so impressive and we could probably spend a podcast talking about it. A lot of times we hear the expression that a person's purpose is fully expressed when their unique skills and talent meets the needs of the moment. So I'd love to hear your take on who is Brad? What is your purpose from that perspective? Because, you know, we can list your accomplishments, but that's not as fun as as hearing (laughs) why. Why do you do all this? Yeah, it's not as if I'm some kind of saint trying to save the world. I'm just a really practical guy with some really practical experience and that I can bring to the table. You know, when I first got involved with the organizations of and for people with disabilities, it goes back to 1991 when my friend Rick Hansen asked me to get involved in the largest Congress and exposition on disability ever held. It was Independence 92. 93 countries attended, 2,700 delegates from around the world. And uh, the honorary chairman of the, of the event was the Prime Minister of Canada. And our closing plenary session was hosted by the Secretary General of the UN. So it was a very, very big deal. At that time, I, I was in the television business, and Rick asked me to produce an event for him. And I approached it that way. But suddenly, I was exposed to disability in all forms. And some of the shakers and movers in the, in the community, like Justin Dart and John Roberts, and Henry Enns, and, and oh gosh, Laurie Beecham. They, this goes on and on. And what I was completely struck by was how much they needed help in communication <laughs> yes. to get the word out. That was the key. Mm-hmm. And for my the 25 years before I took that job, I worked in the television business. And I was a producer and writer and cameraman and all those other things as well. But at the end of the day, I felt like I could fill this hole. I could bring this to the the table, the thing that I saw that no one else seemed to see is how industry was never brought to the table. What the discussions always were were between people with disabilities amongst themselves and then people with disabilities with government. And <laughs> nobody brought industry to the table. And I saw a real opportunity to do that. And so when that conference ended, I thought at first I would just go back into television land and do my thing. But corporate Canada started to call. We said, we heard your message. What do we do? And the problem was no one knew what to do. Yeah. Well, we showed them. That's amazing. Maybe we should start with 
in in the nineties compared to now, we we have moved the needle a lot. You've moved the needle a lot. But I think let's go back and and let's just set a stage for what even let's let's go to nomenclature. What let's start talking about even some of the language that we're we've become so accustomed to now. And we talk about you bridging that gap. The gap is huge between the nineties and now. Sure. Sure. Let, let's get some language straight so that we're all on the same page. Well, you know, as far as language is concerned, you have to understand, you have to believe that the pen is mightier than the sword. Mm. Using the right language is the, the key. I, I believe in first-person language. I, I believe in referring to people with disabilities. I know other people would rather be identified by their disability, but that's a personal choice. But when we're talking to able-bodied people, talking to people with disabilities, or, or you know, getting any kind of presentation, you have to take the position that you're people first. If you assume that we're disabled first, then that changes the way you look at me. That's you're brilliant. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing thing. When we did the uh, 2010 games, there were 25,000 volunteers. It would be impossible to give them all disability awareness training. I wanted to, but there was just no hope. So what can we do? Asked the powers that be. And I said, we teach them a very simple thing, just to refer to people with disabilities. And a miracle happened. First, the people they were talking to recognized that they understood. You know, they didn't just start off with disability stuff. The first question out of their mouth wasn't how it happened. The first thing out of their mouth was people with disabilities recognized that we are people first. Right. The disability was present, it had to be addressed, had to be dealt with, but it wasn't how you led the conversation. And when we taught the volunteers to say that, that changed the way they viewed people. They started viewing I, us as people. What a miracle. I'm just I'm just thinking about it now because back in the day, like the nomenclature was disabled people. Oh, yeah, always. The always. same words. But yeah. you flip the script on that and all of a sudden, everything changed. The, the way you approach it, the way you feel about it when you say those words feels different even. Yeah. I, I can't explain it from a, from a psychological perspective, but I've seen it in action. I've seen mm-hmm. it change it creates in people. And it's such a simple little thing. And Mm -hmm. and, and it's a great place to start. Now, again, if someone comes forward and says, well, I would prefer to be called a quadriplegic or a a disabled person, whatever you want to be called, that's your right. And I'm happy to do that. But uh, as a place to start, recognize that we're people. And then all these other doors start to open. Right. Well, it's not the truth for everything. But specifically, when when we want to make some fundamental changes, I think we it's important to get the language right. Well, sometimes, you know, it goes to that idea. Like a lot of people are surprised when I say I have a job. There's no expectation for me to have a job as a person with disability. Their assumption is, you know, you'll be on welfare or you'll be at home or somebody's looking after you. That's the assumption. George W. Bush had a great line about this. He called it the soft prejudice of low expectation. So if you don't have any expectation that I'm going to work, then why would you make your workplace accessible? Mm-hmm. You have no expectations for me. If, if that's what you think I'm capable of, then we both have a problem. Right. And what what a loss of resources and wisdom and oh, yeah. innovation. Now, and we got numbers to back that up now. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, when, when we talk about people, people with disabilities, we're not only talking about the obviously physical disabilities that we can see. We're talking a full gamut of you know, some people call it mental health disabilities or whatever the nomenclature there is. But I think I think it's really important to start thinking about when you think about people, you start thinking about all the issues and disabilities that people have. And it's not just physical. It's not just someone in a wheelchair, which is the obvious thing oh. when we envision someone with a disability. Can you talk to that a little bit? Is that something that the Rick Hansen Foundation is also looking at? Oh, constantly. We get pigeons told all the time, oh, you're focused on wheelchair stuff. And that's based on their prejudice, looking at a right. picture of Rick in a wheelchair. Right. So they're making the assumption that all you guys do is wheelchair stuff. And they look at me as a wheelchair user and say, see, there's two of you. That's all you do is wheelchair stuff. And when, in fact, we've never been wheelchair-centric. We've never been, in spite of all the accusations from various places. But the bottom line for us is that's the great thing about what's happening right now. That lens is opening wide up. And the idea of hidden disabilities. And, and for every wheelchair user, there's 4,000 people who are hard of hearing. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and, and the neurodiverse community is a huge giant piece of this. Absolutely. Yeah. 
It's enormous. And that that's what's giving me the greatest hope right now because, and this may seem odd coming from a wheelchair user, but gosh, those wheelchair guys, they've dominated the discussion since day one, <laughs> dominated codes, dominated the regulations. All right. Or when you ask a person on the street about disability, the first thing that pops in their head is a wheelchair. Exactly. Yeah. International symbol for people with disabilities is a wheelchair. And yet we're less than 30% of the community of people with disabilities. Problem that creates is when codes are all wheelchair centric, that means if you've got a building code, sorry, a code minimum access strategy. So if all you're doing as an operator is, is getting your building up to code, then you're reaching about 30% of the community, which means you're not reaching 70%. And more mm-hmm. importantly, from an industry perspective, you're missing 70% of the return on investment because you don't know one of the fundamentals about creating meaning, meaningful access, and that is, who are people with disabilities? Right. I got news for you. It's not about a few wheelchair guys. Right. I mean, that's a great place to start Start thinking about it, is who, who are we serving? And actually be broad about that. Yeah, I, I, we talk about it all the time. It's one of... It's one of the really classic things in our business because the focus is on the mobility because it's yeah. you know, but you know there's so many people with disabilities that don't disclose the whole idea of self-identifying for lots of reasons. I always laugh. We had a, we had a, a company come to us and say, well, you know, we want to reach out. We want to start hiring some people with disabilities. We want to you know and really reach out and, and and create that. And I said, you recognize that you already have a large percent of your staff that has disabilities <laughs> not reporting them, right? Yeah. You recognize that you've got a lot of people who are hard of hearing who will never tell you that because they're out of the fear to hold them back in their career. Right. It will. If you do that, it will. Mm-hmm. It, you know, same with people with mental illness. This idea that it's about somebody else, that, uh, that disability is about somebody else, that, act, that access isn't personal. You know, we, we focus on wheelchair users and people with mobility impairment in terms of codes. But in terms of what you actually have to achieve, it's a whole different world. And, 24% of the population right now reports having a significant disability. Mm-hmm. And now that key word there is report. A lot of people don't report for a lot of really good reasons, some of which I talked about a moment ago. So it, it sounds as if we, we need to do better as a society on creating an environment where reporting is comfortable. Yeah, or unnecessary. Or unnecessary. Okay, let's talk about that. I uh, like that approach. Our focus is on the built environment. And it's it's not to say the other pillars of accessibility, you know, transportation, employment, uh, web access, communication. It's not to say it's more important than them. But what an accessible built environment does is it enables all those other pillars to thrive. Right. You know, like accessible transportation isn't as critical when there's no accessible destinations, right? Right. The most avid employment equity program in the world falls flat if I can't get in the building. Mm-hmm. The built environment has to be the first one to respond. The built environment, you know, and we and, and the other pillars can get around it, but to thrive, to really work, to really have the, you know, the, the kind of impact that we want it to have, you've got to have an accessible built environment. If you can't get to work, if you can't get in the building, if you can't use the building you're in. So that's why our focus has been on the built environment and ever since I got here and seven years now, I've been working on the RHFAC. But that's the motive. That's the motive. The chain reaction that happens after that is just remarkable. Well, I, I want to touch a little bit, go back a little bit and touch on that point you made about, or we don't have to work on reporting because you said something that I really love this quote. Let me see if I can find it. I think you said that if someone asks you to give them a picture of what accessibility looks oh. like. So I, brilliant. I, I love that quote. And you said, well, I can't because if it's truly accessible, you can't actually see it. Yeah, I might be misquoting you, but something to no, that effect. No, it, it it's uh, if you do it right, it's invisible. So I don't know how many many, many of your listeners tend to relate to Vancouver International Airport, for example. It is fabulous. It is beautiful. It is so accessible. It's crazy, and yet you don't see the little blue stick man all over the place. Right. No, he's not on every counter. He's not on every washroom. You see him in the holding rooms. A couple of seats have to be held for people with disabilities. That's understandable. But because it's a universal environment, we don't label things that are accessible. We highlight things that are not accessible. Amazing. Make sure the community understands that. So that, that's that expectation. Why should we have to label things that are accessible? That's nuts. Mm-hmm. That's nuts. Because that means the expectation has to be that it won't be. 
that's no place to start. That's a really yeah. able approach. It's it's just like on that when you see a power door operator and you see that little blue stick man on the button that opens the door. What happens when you push that button? Does a little blue genie appear in a wheelchair and grant you three wishes? <laughs> it doesn't. I can assure you, I've tried many times. You know, yeah. You know what's funny? I've used that button when I've had my hands full of groceries. So, like, you know what I mean? So we're we're talking about something that is not when we talk about access and inclusive access and equal access, we are not talking about the guy in the wheelchair or the, or the person in the wheelchair. We're talking about access for all of us carrying on our lives. Just works better. It yeah. just works better. Well, the problem with the little stick man on the, what it should say is open door, even better, an icon that shows a door opening. Right. I but like that. Otherwise, why am I labeled disabled? Why do right. you stick a label on me saying, okay, this is where the disabled guy goes. Mm-hmm. And he goes to this door and he goes to this counter. And looking at YVR, the counters are all exactly the same. You can go to any counter. And they're all equally accessible. And that's just universal design. That's, that's the power of universal design. It takes the labels off people. We need to be taking labels off, not putting them on. So I, I, I fight the little blue guy every chance I get. <laughs> well, you know, this is at the heart of dignity, right? So when, when we talk about these things in pragmatic, you're as, as you said, you're a very pragmatic person. But I think it really strikes at the heart of dignity. And how how do we want to shape our society? Do we want it to be dignified for everyone to be living in harmony and thriving? And so it really boils down to that, being able to look at every human being and making the decision that dignity is is the number one protocol, number one design criteria. Yes. And maybe that's where we start taking the little stick man off the things. Well, it, it's where education comes in. It's where understanding comes in. At the Rick Hansen Foundation, we have the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification Program. And its greatest strength is its training that goes with it. Because we're not training people to be access consultants. We're training people how to use the RHFAC certification program, which is a disability lens. And the moment you lay it over top, you start seeing things you never saw before. Right. The power of that is once you start seeing them, you can't stop. I don't have to retrain you ever. Because you'll right. never stop seeing. Now you might not do anything about it. <laughs> That's another problem. But at the same time, if you don't see it, you have to understand that access is a moving target. What we considered accessible in the 70s wouldn't even make level one of what we're doing these days. You know, in the 70s, access was a parking spot and a ramp. That was it. You know, access breeds access. Access begets access. So in the 70s, you know, when Rick Hansen's of the world, the high-functioning paraplegics, we started doing curb ramps. I didn't come along until the 80s, but, you know, uh, Rick started doing this program, but a curb ramps cut. It's a really great program. I think they got 4,000 curb ramps cut. And when, when, well, and the bad news was there's 52,000 left to do. But, hey, 4,000 is not bad. I was going to say. 4,000 is not bad. Though, right? Good start. Problem was, immediately after that, the phone started to ring, and it's people with vision loss, people who are blind, saying, what are you doing? The only clue we have when we're walking off a sidewalk is stepping off the curb. Now we're walking into traffic and having no idea that we've left the sidewalk. What are you doing? No contrast, no tactile. Right. No, even amongst us, we should know better. So, that, you know, in the 70s, they were designed for it's a high-functioning parasite. Along comes the 80s and the quads. You know, quads never used to survive. Then something called the paramedic service was brought in, especially in Vancouver. And so people who broke their necks, like myself, survived. Well, all of a mm-hmm. sudden now we're out in the community. And they had all these great curb wraps that were designed for, for uh, Rick Hansen's. I'm no Rick <laughs> Hansen, but hey, it's close enough. It's a ramp. And so access, all of a sudden now I'm in the community. So the quads and the parents in the community. Next thing that happened in the 90s, we began the older adults and seniors. And the thing about the older adults and seniors is they don't have a disability. They have multiple disabilities. Right. Combined with mobility, combined with cognitive, combined with vision, any combination you can think of. And not only do they have multiple disabilities, they're in complete denial. All right? <laughs> yes. I can find my arms aren't long enough. <laughs> or my favorite, I can hear fine if you stop mumbling. I've used it. that, I've used those words before. Is my arm my, my my arms are still long enough. <laughs> So, you know, as, as operators, as designers, as, as people operating major major public buildings or even private buildings, 
we have to now create buildings that are accessible and don't look like it. This idea that putting a, a ramp on it and putting a little blue sticker guy on it, my mother won't do that. My mother, my mother's classic. My mother wouldn't let us put a grab bar in her shower because she was afraid that, well, what if people saw it? They think she was disabled. Interesting. So that begs two questions, of course. Yeah. One, mom, who are you showering with? But number two, <laughs> really, mom, you jeopardize your own personal safety over the look of something? It's an unqualified yes. Mm-hmm. But she calls a handicapped cow. He thinks they're great for me. But that little blue stick man, I'm not disabled. I'm just getting old. Well, as operators, that creates a big problem for us. We have to create meaningful access to that's absolutely invisible. Fortunately, that's exactly what Universal Design de- delivers. It's perfect. Right. So, I mean, in the Rick Hansen Foundation list of people you work with, mostly organizations. And I know we're 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 trying to talk to, we're talking to an audience that are both individual or represent organizations, generally speaking, the general public. And It'd be great if you can sort of go through what Rick Hansen does, what the Rick Hansen Foundation does, who do you align with or or work with, and how can both organizations in terms of government organizations, universities and campuses, offices, and even developers who are doing residential, like how, how do they start and what's their journey through the Rick Hansen Foundation? Well, we work with everyone. <laughs> we truly do. One of the great things about the Rick Hansen Foundation is our ability to cross communities. We're obviously, we're members of the community of people with disabilities. We relate constantly with the other organizations of and for people with disabilities. But we also involve industry. We we have an uncanny knack to open corporate doors and get them involved in the discussion. So we are in a unique position. And that's, in fact, why the RHFAC has been so successful. It's only the Rick Hansen Foundation that can pull this off. A massive project, but only by having that kind of broad understanding of, of how the industry works, we're able to pull this off. Having said that, what do we do? We've, if you're an organization and you want to improve your whole inclusion portfolio, there's really easy places to start. And I would start with disability awareness training. Have your staff up to speed on language and etiquette, at least, if not more. Mm-hmm. But at least language and etiquette. People are very uncomfortable talking about disability because they don't know the right words. You know, mother taught them not to stare, so they won't look at you. And is it people <laughs> or is it disabled? Or what do you want to be? I never know what you want to be called. And they're always looking away the other way. And I don't, I don't know what, well, I'm just afraid to talk to you. I don't know what you want to be called. How about calling me a person? Right. But anyway, having that base knowledge as part of normal professional development, as part of what you do every day, because I'm telling you, you already have. 30% of your staff with some kind of disabilities, I'll put money on it, whether you know it or not. So knowing the language, knowing the etiquette, knowing, and understanding, it helps people challenge their assumptions about what people with disabilities are actually capable of. The second thing you can do is to create a design criteria manual for your company. Don't be satisfied with code minimum access strategies. Yeah. Your business is different, however it's different. So create a design criteria manual that works for your organization, for your goals, for how you're trying to translate this, how your DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion program works. Have one that's yours. Now, that has to be developed by a professional, but we can do that at RHFAC. It was so can Universal Access Design or a number of other companies do that for you. So have your own manual. Don't, Don't be a code minimum strategy or you're just done. The RHFAC is your best friend. If you you can't fix anything unless you know it's broken. Right. All the RHFAC does is come in and tell you what's really there right now. We're not the code police. We don't come in there, wag our fingers and say, nan, 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 nan. We tell you what's there, who it affects. And the other thing we do is, is we identify the good stuff too. The stuff that works, you get points for. Right. You get some points. If you do something really cool, spread the gospel, tell other people how to do it. But the very, very best thing you can do as an organization if you really want to change how your culture is, the first thing you should do is just hire a person with a disability. I'm not talking about it. Stop clutching your pearls and worrying about how tough it's going to be. A magic thing happens. When you hire a person with a disability, all of this stuff becomes about Brad instead of being about reg- regulations. Right. You learn not to, you know, you hire a person with vision loss. You learn not to leave the bottom door of the plumbing cabinet open because you're going to trip. Right. You learn not to leave things in the aisle. And you learn, and all of a sudden, you learn that, hey, you know what? That's actually just a person. 
And if I just talk to them, amazing things happen. They talk back. Yeah. So it's really, it's it's not, this is not a complicated thing. There's just this inertia we got to overcome. And, you know, and this idea that as we watch the news and that I'm watching, you know, owners of bars and pubs and we can't find anybody to hire. Oh gosh, we got to improve immigration rules because we can't find anybody to hire. 57% of the people with disabilities are, are unemployed. Can't even say that sort of tragic. 57% of our community. And that's the people who are ready, willing, and able to work. Yeah. And you're telling me you can't find anybody to work? You're, where are you looking? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you know, we we are talking a lot about justice and equity and inclusivity. And often we kind of for, we forget people with disabilities as part of inclusivity. You know, just because you can't see a disability, they're not diverse enough to like fill fill the checkbox. So what you're talking about is let's get beyond the checkbox. Uh, let's yeah, actually a implement survey, some yeah. real change. A recent survey of the valuable 500 companies, only 4% of them recognized accessibility as part of their inclusive. inclusive. Mm-hmm. Only 4%. And, and that's where that comes from is how policymakers silo things, right? So they're going to they're silo you know, efforts to create programs for people who are in the BIPOC community. They might create silos for people who are, are to improve poverty reduction. They might create a silo for Indigenous people. And they create a silo for people with disabilities without recognizing that we're part of all those other silos. Yes. Something separate they can add after the fact, like it's landscaping. And that's what people who work with the RHFAC discover. And they discover, A, how easy it is. It's crazy easy when you just take a deep breath and, and face it. It's not hard at all. But the other thing that, that happens is that little cultural shift. That little, you know, again... This was when our program was not designed to create a bunch of access professionals. It was designed to take the existing culture, the existing architects, planners, building inspectors, the guys that swing the hammers, the tradespeople, and help them just see who people with disabilities are and why we're trying to do this and why it has to be mainstream. It can't be this separate thing off to the side. It can't be, you know, setting aside 10% of your, your development as accessible, whatever that means. That's not going to do the huh. same. You know, the other thing that like you said to me the other day we were, we were chatting is that you follow the building code in five to 10 years, you're going to be outdated. Oh, yeah. And then the building lasts 50 to 60 years. What are you going to do? You're done. That, and that's my biggest battle, to try to stop you from building new mistakes. Yes. It takes me 50 years to get them out of the system. Right. And so it's really critical that we get to the people doing it now. It can't be something... That, our training will take hold in 20 years from now. Everybody will be trained. Well, I, I don't have 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have to get to these people faster. And, and that's the real power of the RHFAC. that they see. It's creating its own community. It's created a community of the Access Professionals Network now. And there are people who have taken the course, who understand real access, who are, who are people who have an interest in it. And now we've got that pool of knowledge and people bringing new stuff in all the time. And as I said, access is the moving target. So there's new solutions out there all the time. And so how, you know, you can't stand on a soapbox and say, I know all there is to know about creating access to a pool. Because any day now, someone's going to invent a new foo-foo valve that you know, simply touch this button and you magically get transported. <laughs> I hope so. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so one awareness, and this is all, one can just go to the Rick Hansen Foundation and look at this. One Rick is awareness. Hansen.com. Wickhanson.com. One, oh, we'll put the link in, in when we when we post this. We'll put the link in so people can easily find you. But one, awareness, training. Two, create your own design criteria manual. Three, hire someone who has a disability so that you have that lived experience. Yes. And, and it'll draw your other employees out as well. Yes. And, Simple. You know, make it one, safe, two, and three. Make it safe. Yeah, Your HR people need to understand that they can make this a safe environment for people to self-declare. It's not safe right now. Yeah. So, I want to touch a little bit on that because, again, we, we keep talking about access, inclusive access. Yeah. But we, we keep talking about designing specifically for people with disabilities. But let's talk about what the benefit of designing for people with disabilities are for the community as a whole, for people who are, as you put it, Temporarily able-bodied. Yeah. Well, yeah. Hey, what did COVID teach us? 
for us in the community, we had to, aside from the tragedy of the whole thing, we had to sit back and laugh a little bit because all the able-bodied people were completely freaked out. Oh, my God, we can't go to the restaurant we like. Oh, my God, we can't take a bus. Oh, my God, I can't go to the theater. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah. I, they got all whipped up about this stuff. Oh, my God, oh, my God. And, and, and we're sitting there, well, this is what we deal with every single day. And so the core message that we're trying to get out, especially to business, is that access is not a design decision. It's a management decision. Architects will build anything you tell them to build. You know, if you want a hotel with a glass bottom pool hanging out over the roadway, like you do downtown Vancouver, that looked impossible, but they did that okay. That's true. So designing a ramp is probably pretty simple, but the owner's got to want it first, right? If you have that first, if organization, the employees, if the people, the people demand more, right? This idea that you can move into a house tomorrow, a brand new home, and the first thing you have to do is renovate if you're a person with a disability. Mm-hmm. That's outrageous. It's so outrageous. And we have we have detailed studies that show unequivocally that it doesn't cost anything to build it properly, starting with the design phase. Cost is zero. If you want to go all the way to our highest standard gold with all the bells and whistles, maybe one percent of your project. Okay. It's not a cost issue. Right. I've got, I've got lots of studies if people want to see those. But at the end of the day, this is not rocket science either. A number of times we do we go through a course, we get an architect from the other side, and he'll say, that's it. That's it. Yeah. It's really not difficult. For us, our focus really has been on commercial and retail space. We uh, worked with the Conference Board of Canada. We asked them a very simple question. If in Canada, if all the commercial and retail space, just those spaces, let's set everything else aside for a moment, if they were accessible to our minimum level at the RHFAC, and just by way of comparison, if you built a, a commercial space to the letter of the law in the Ontario Building Code, and met every access provision, you might get around 40% on our scale. But we require more. But if you built it to our minimum, what would that mean? And the Conference Board of Canada came back after four months of intense study, came back and said, here's what it means. It means your 57% of your, of your community is currently unemployed. If you made that space accessible and they could work and the employment levels dropped to the normal in the rest of the community, that would mean $16.8 billion on the gross domestic product every single year. Now, I know that if there was $16 billion buried out in the road there, we'd go get it. That's true. A special tool to do that, like the RHFAC, then we would get the tool. And if we needed training to work that tool, like the RHFAC, then we would dig that song gun up. We would not leave $16 billion in the ground. And yet, here we are doing that every single day. Every single day. That's really illuminating. It's mm-hmm. it's that notion. It's that idea of, well, employment is the holy grail. You know, if I have a job as a person with a disability, I have a bank account. If I have a bank account, I have a credit card. If I have a credit card, I can get a mortgage. If I can get a mortgage, maybe they start building homes for us instead of against us. Maybe they stop considering us non-market. That's one of the most infuriating thing in the world. There's 1.3 billion people in the world with disabilities, according to the World Health Organization. That's a bigger market than China, by the way. And yet we're considered non-market, right? We're the largest minority group in the world and the only one that any one of you can join at any moment. You probably will. Mm-hmm. You could fall down the stairs, a car accident, or medical condition. You could live to a ripe old age and need a walker in a area. You are going to be a person with a disability. The only question is when and for how long. See tabs above. You know, you always invite a tab to the party because somebody left the chips in the top shelf. You have to have a temporarily a body person around somewhere. Let's define tab. Tab is temporarily able body. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. If you do it right, you might get to your 60s before you need help. Or you may do a face plant when you're a teenager and end up in a wheelchair. Yes. Either way, you are going to join my community. The only way to avoid it is to die young. I don't recommend that. I mean, but then there's also your parents and your grandparents. Oh, you, well, you know, it's not. So let's just say you die young, but you still see your parents and your grandparents suffer and, and not have dignity in, in their ability to access everything yeah. that we take for granted as tabs, you know. The COVID example. Yeah. What did we learn? Well, we learned that warehousing our older adults and seniors in dark little buildings at the end of cul-de-sacs looking after minimum wage, looked after by minimum wage people is not a good model. We have to keep people in their homes, in their communities as long as humanly possible. And when they do need extra help, it needs to be in the community, not somewhere else. 
And the only way to do that is to create truly inclusive environments, to create accessible living spaces, accessible. When grandma can't go to watch her grandson play hockey at the local arena because the sidewalks are too rough or maybe she's afraid of the stairs at the arena, when she can't do that, a little thread breaks. In the yes. One yeah. little thread breaks. And that keeps happening. And sooner or later, mom's at home all the time by herself. Mm-hmm. That's not good for anyone. So, you know, intergenerational living is one of the great benefits of universal design in the housing market. Now, we don't do single family dwellings and we don't do a lot of inside the homes on the RHFAC. There's programs, though, that do look after that really well, like the Safer Home Society. So we do rent to the door and they do inside the suite kind of thing. But the right. bottom line is, if you do this right, we talked about this earlier in terms of design. The thing about design is, if you look after the young people, you know, and you look after the old people, anyone over the age of 60, everything else will work itself out. And, and you don't have That's to use disabled language at that point. Yeah. Make it safe for mom. Make it safe for your kids. Everything else will work itself out. Yeah. It's really simple when you put it in those terms. It's really simple. Yeah, make it a lot more complicated. Now, there's there's all kinds of issues that we have to resolve. You know, one of the premium issues is for people with environmental sensitivities, is how do we keep them from being exposed to that harsh environment? We don't know the answer to that. We're still looking for some answers from that. And we will. We'll keep looking for that. The same with the neurodiverse community. How can we do more? Mm-hmm. Right now, it's kind of focused on wayfinding and reducing anxiety. It's kind of focused on creating that clarity. So they walk into... A building, you know, the, the receptionist is clearly clearly defined, and so it, it's easy to operate. And so we can do those kinds of things. But I know there's more we can do. But part yeah. of this is is doing the research, doing the studies, and Accessible Standards Canada is doing a great job on on doing this background research and getting standards set up so people know where to start from at least. I mean, we are unfortunately. I mean, we could talk for a long time, but we're getting we're getting to we're getting sadly to the end. I think this is going to be a longer a longer podcast than than normal. But I think our listeners would be really interested in all the things you've had to say. Um, well, you know, if you want to do another one, we can drill down on any one of these. I would love to do another one. We can drill down on on older adults and seniors. Absolutely, then, because they're all incredibly deep and. We did a recent Angus Reid poll, and we, it revealed that 50% of the population is touched by disability in some form or another. Yes. This is not about somebody else. 50%. So if yeah. you're operating a business, can you put up your hand and say, I don't care about 50% of the market? Because that's yeah. what you're doing with a code minimum access strategy. <laughs> I don't care about those guys. Yeah. See? I mean, sadly, we have to put it in monetary terms, right? But I mean, oh, yeah, I, well, I want to go I want to go back to the dignity, the dignity yeah. of the matter and just you know, end it like let's let's end it on the dignity side because yeah, the money. I mean, Rick Hansen Foundation has done the studies to show, as you said, the money is really not the issue. I think we really need to start thinking about this in terms of a hum- a human uh, aspect, a dignity aspect. And I want to ask you this last question, Brad, if you don't mind indulging me in a little visioning here. So let's assume, <laughs> let's assume tomorrow morning we woke up. And we had inclusive access. Give us a little vision of what that could be like, what that could feel like, what, how that would enrich all of our lives. Wow. It's the dream, of course. Yes. <laughs> what does that look like? That looks like intergenerational living. That looks like not having to leave your community just because you're getting old. Mm-hmm. Not having to leave your community because you can't participate in one aspect of it. It means not having to justify your existence every time you go somewhere because I need access. Well, what do you need access for? Well, because I'm a person. You, know, you want to get tickets to a concert and try to explain to a to ticket master why you can't sit on the, the main floor around 3,000 other people in a wheelchair. When we get to the point where people understand these issues and I don't have to walk down that path every time, just to, you know, the dignity of being able to understand the wheelchair seating at a concert. They stick us up on these little, you know, we call them, <laughs> we call them gimmick trays. They're stuck on the side of the of the bowl, and and they're lined up with fifty wheelchairs, hub to hub. Most often, you're the person you came with has to sit behind you because code required X number of wheelchair spots, and they've got them all hub to hub beside each other. So if you can't sit beside your wife because that would take off a spot, so they sit behind you. So that's delightful. Mm. Well, we don't have to do those kinds of we don't have to explain ourselves every time we go somewhere. When someone can walk up and and being deaf isn't something absolutely wild and crazy. 
when we can get to the stage where people assume that I'm capable and not assume that I'm not capable, then we're getting here. But to do that, we have to enable us. We have to enable everyone. And that means the built environment has to be able to do that. The built environment is the key to all of this stuff. The key to inclusion is the key to... Remember that inclusion is an outcome. It's not a thing unto itself. Yes. How do you create that outcome? Well, you start with the built environment. That's why our focus has been on the built environment. And we catch a little flack for that. Because every time I have a conversation with someone as charming as you, I always drag it back to the built environment. Because until that's sorted out, nothing else is going to really matter. Because the way to hit home, the way to, the way to make this a non-issue, the way to make this so that it's, if you do it right, you don't even have to talk about disability is to challenge people's assumptions, expand that basic core integrity that you have to have as a designer. How can you call yourself an architect, planner, designer, if you're not considering 50% of the population? Yeah. I mean, the built environment is where we play out our best lives, right? So Where we live, work, learn, and play, as my father. Yeah. yeah. So if you say 50% of you can't do those things, Put it in that same survey, 30% of the population is already deciding where they go based on accent. Yeah. Well, restaurants or parties are, you know, why is Disneyland so incredibly accessible? Because they get it. Yes. Why is Las Vegas absolutely amazing for older adults and seniors? Because they get it. Yeah. They want the seniors sitting there pounding that damn slot machine all day. Well, how do you do yeah. that? Well, you make it easy for them. All right. You don't put a stool in front of a slot machine. You put a a high chair with the back and arms that'll support them and give them you know, a place to put their arms. You don't have them park in the parquet to have to walk you know, two blocks to get into the casino. Go to Vegas. If you're older out in Sierra, you just drop your car in the center and get out and the valley guys will take care of it and there will be no charge. Yeah. They, get it. they took off their little wheelchair symbols a long time ago. When you go into a casino in Vegas, there's a button. But most of them are waivers now. It's motion control. But there's no little disability guy. There's no little blue guy saying come in because the older adults and seniors don't want it. (laughs) And so when you look at how they've been able to take advantage of that and what that's done to the culture, it's not really hard. All you have to do is just embrace. You know, all you have to do is we are are not someone else. We are you. We are your mother. I talk all the time to architects. You know, this is about your mom. (laughs) Not about me. Not about Rick. Oh, your mom. I said that to one gentleman once, and he uh, kind of scoffed at me a little bit. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, murmur, murmur. and the next day, literally the next day, he phoned me and he said, My mother just fell in the bathroom in exactly the way you described, trying to get to the tub. That's what we do. In a house, we put the sink, the toilet, and the tub. They're all, all the plumbing's all on the same wall. Yes. Do that because it's easier for the plumber. Right. My mother, or in this case, the architect's mother, to run the tub, you put one foot between the toilet and the tub. We all do this. You lean way over and you turn on the tub. Mm-hmm. If you're going to fall, you're going to fall right there. Yep. If you fall there and you're over the age of 65, you've got a 20% chance of being dead in the calendar year. And you've got a 50% chance of never getting out of an institution. And the architect says, well, no, we, we can't make the bathrooms bigger. We can't do that. Okay. But what you could do is pick the tub up, rotate it 180 degrees, and put it down in the same space. Now just move the controls to the open wall. From the toilet, they have to be open anyway. You want to go crazy? Suck them over six inches. Right? <laughs> now you're not leaning over at all. Yeah. You run the tub and you're done. And yeah. it's going to cost you about 30 bucks extra plumbing, a half hour of plumber's time. But yeah. you probably saved the Falls Prevention guys over at BC uh, and the province of BC. Uh, they estimate that that could save like up to 20% of falls in the home. Yeah. If you break your hip, that costs the system about $110,000. Right. Again, simple. 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 So challenge yeah. your assumption. I, you yeah. tell me you can't. Universal design is your best friend in small space. And architects tell me, oh, no, we can't do it. We can't, we can't make it accessible. That's because you don't know what accessible is. That's because yeah. you're so locked into this idea that it has to work for you know, people in powered chairs. Well, as you were ta- talking about it, I, I was thinking about my vision for what an accessible world is. And it's really simple. Good. I want to be able to go with my friend who is mobility challenged to a restaurant and then have to rearrange all the furniture. I have the simple things, eh? So simple. Yeah, and it's not hard. That's my vision. Well, you know, it's a good vision. Spread the word. Tell your friends. <laughs> well, we will. Certainly, with the, again, really appreciate you being on the Happy Texture podcast, because this is how we spread the word. This is how, you know, 
we want to spread the word. So having you here yeah, is such a treat. The premise you're starting from, happy touching. Architecture does affect how you feel and how you, the whole idea of architects, you know, that they, they talk about the impact on the community and all this stuff. It does. It really does. Absolutely. Truly. Absolutely. And so let's get happy. Let's get happy. Let's start working on happy as part of the building code. <laughs> yeah, there's no way for the code. We'll be waiting forever. It takes five to seven know. years to change the code in this country. So don't wait for the code. No, this is why we talk to people like you, Brad. All right. I'm here if you care. Absolutely. So such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time and your generosity and your wisdom. And I'm sure we'll connect again. I hope you can come back. Let's dig deeper. Let's dig deeper. Let's dig deeper. <laughs> you've certainly you've certainly rattled a few assumptions in my in my mind. So I'd love to chat more. Then my work here is done. <laughs> Thank you once again. Such a pleasure to have you. I hope you have a great day. And uh, we'll be in touch. Yes, please. For more information on this or any other episodes of the Happy Texture podcast, you can find us at happytexture.com. H-A-P-P-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E dot com. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Happy Texture podcast. Thanks to our sponsor, Cora Architecture and Interiors, creating spaces for your well-being. The Happy Texture podcast is produced by Janessa Klatt.